Hey, what's up everyone? Jamie here from CLA and it's Motivation Monday for April 6, 2020. Productivity, self-development, and positivity are just some of the topics we cover on Mondays. Mondays don't have to suck. They're an opportunity to start fresh and get things done. First, let's start with filmmaker and YouTuber Matt Diavella. He always makes great videos, and lately he's been creating some really useful guides to getting through these challenging times. So, I was originally gonna release a video today about email optimization, but it feels like kind of a weird time to be giving out productivity tips, so I'm gonna save that one for another day. So right about now, pretty much everything you could imagine is getting canceled, from festivals to concerts, even my wedding. To be honest, I was a little bit upset when we first had to postpone our wedding an entire year, but compared to the NBA, I don't know, it just seems like not that big of a deal. Happy birthday to you. Now, this is a serious time and it requires serious action. And it's gotten me to think about how people respond when they're faced with that tasteless, odorless, scentless thing called uncertainty. So you can see it in the stock market on a pretty much daily basis as things continue to seesaw from record highs to record lows. The only thing that you can guarantee right now is that things will continue to remain uncertain. But if you prepare accordingly, this should not be a time to panic. Allow me to illustrate. This is what I like to call the axis of uncertainty. When faced with uncertainty, we have very limited options with what we can do and how we can react. You've got those who are underprepared, those who are overprepared, and everywhere in between, and people who react emotionally with a range from panic to calm. Up here, we've got those who are panicked and underprepared. It's your classic deer in headlights. You recognize that there's a problem, that you should probably do something, but you're just so damn scared that you fail to take any kind of action. They're usually the first people to get eaten by zombies. I mostly feel bad for these people. And down here, we've got those who are underprepared and calm. At a time like this, your parents are probably down here. You might find yourself down here for a few reasons. Maybe you've become desensitized by the media always fear-mongering that when a real crisis happens, you don't believe them. Maybe you trust the wrong sources entirely. Anyway, not a good place to be. It's not a great place to be because you're not thinking critically and when it's really important to take action, it's either too late or you fail to do so. Zombies are going to eat these people as well. Ah, and up here, a lethal combination of panic and overpreparedness. These are the people who go out and buy a year-long supply of toilet paper. I don't blame them really because panic is known to cause massive bouts of diarrhea. But when you clear out all the hand sanitizer and canned soup, you're being a dick. It's both selfish and short-sighted. They're so panicked that they aren't rational enough to prepare mindfully, and as a result, they too get eaten by zombies. Don't be that person. Finally, down in this lower right quadrant is really where you want to be, say right around here. You're cautious, you've taken the necessary steps to prepare, you've got enough non-perishable food and essential medical supplies to last you a few weeks, and you remain calm knowing that you've done everything you possibly can. And as a result, you'll probably be able to fight off the zombies. But even if you are calm, admittedly, you can still be overprepared. And what to note here is the law of diminishing returns when it comes to preparedness. The more you prepare, the better you'll be able to tackle whatever problem it is that you're facing, up until a certain point, when those benefits begin to diminish and then flatline. Continuing to prepare beyond that has diminishing returns. At this point, you're simply wasting your time. And it could crash even further when people's opinion of you and your community change because you hoarded all the toilet paper because of your diarrhea panic. And now here's the real beauty of finding your sweet spot on the access of uncertainty and a lesson that can be applied to any major project in your life. You follow a simple checklist. Do enough research to make an informed decision. Take effective action without overdoing it. Stay calm knowing you did all you could. Adjust your plan as new information comes out. Last week I featured a video from Mariana's Study Corner, a great channel for learners. Last Friday, April 4th, was supposed to be her wedding day. But of course the wedding didn't happen. Everything is closed, the streets are empty, and everyone is staying home. And she's staying home too doing other more mundane things. But here in this video, Mariana tells us how to cope when things don't go according to plan. And before you do any of the things I will suggest in the next few minutes, remember that postponing an event is getting a second chance at something. And there are thousands of people out there that will not get a second chance and who are living through difficult times. 
practicing gratitude and being thankful about your life, despite the difficulties, is what matters the most right now, and the fate of your plans goes second place. If your plans got cancelled, postponed or ruined because of this crisis, allow yourself to cry it out. It's unfair, it's terrible. You'll have to call people or companies, maybe a trip got cancelled and you'll have to ask for a refund on your flight and accommodation. Maybe you are going to start a new school program, a new job, or your final exams were cancelled. Now things won't be as perfect as you imagined them, you'll have to plan everything again, and your effort, time, blood, sweat and tears were wasted towards nothing, right? Well, maybe not. What you need to know is that when things don't go according to plan, you need to gain back two things. The novelty factor and the feeling that it will happen in the right time. Despite the difficulty in setting a date, try to at least establish a distant time frame for completion of your project or event. Defining a date will help you regain novelty and timeliness because there's an actual day to look forward to. To regain novelty, you need to think about what will need to change because of this postponement. This setback will force you to rethink things differently. And maybe that can be an exciting intellectual or artistic challenge for you. Planning out the details of things you'll have to rethink, which things you'll be able to keep, and which things will have to be remade from scratch, can improve that feeling of novelty. You have a new second chance at doing this thing, and you can go back to your alternative scenarios and ponder things over, no strings attached. When you work from home, you become responsible for more decisions, including your plans and priorities. In this video, Thomas Frank walks us through how to make useful plans, both on a daily basis and over the longer term. He also talks about how to prioritize your work and keep track of big projects. At the most basic level, I plan my day by creating what I call a daily list. Now, I do this on the whiteboard in my office, but you can do it basically anywhere. You can use a paper daily list or even rely on the due dates in your task manager. But whatever method you use, there are a few things that you should keep in mind when you're doing your planning. First, realize that the due dates in your task manager may not paint a perfect picture of what you should actually do today, or indeed what you can do today. Now, I say this because I know that I am guilty of continually allowing my intentions to eclipse my abilities. And if I don't stop myself, I will often write down way more tasks than I can realistically get done in any one given day. So try your best to keep this list limited to what you can actually do. And when you fail, and you will inevitably fail sometimes, make an observation of it so you can plan more accurately for the next day. And realize that it might actually take some time to get better at this, as our brains really aren't built for making accurate time estimates. In fact, researchers have found that people typically will give nearly the exact same answer when they are asked to give estimates for the best case scenario versus an average case scenario. Now, of course, by definition, the average case will always take more time than the best case. Like if we're talking about driving to work, which is probably something that you don't actually have to do right now, but let's just use it as an example here. The best case would mean hitting every single green light. It would mean never encountering any traffic at all. And an average case wouldn't look like that at all, but naturally we tend to conflate the two. And finally, we're back with Matt Diavella, who fills us in on how his morning routine has changed recently. Like many of us, he's struggling with how to adjust to a new set of routines and structure in his daily life. So now that I spend all my time at home, I've made some big changes to how I start my days. Typically, I wake up and pull my phone into bed first thing in the morning. It's a time to catch up on some light reading. Then I head to the bathroom to freshen up. I pee sitting down now. It just makes me feel more stable. Then I wash my hands. After that, I make a cup of coffee while catching up on some of my favorite podcasts. I mean, we're going to come out of this as a different nation, a different people, a different, different people, different, a different people. And then I wash my hands again. One mindfulness practice that has really helped me a lot lately is to journal. And finally, I wrap up each morning with a pep talk from Natalie. Now, is everything fine? You want to just get drunk then? It's literally 11 a.m. <laughs> and that is my new morning routine. 
So in all seriousness, I actually have struggled quite a bit over these past few weeks. I wouldn't say that is a complete parody that you saw. A lot of these things are true. I've been consuming too much media. I've been too sedentary. I haven't yet figured out how to uh, bring these habits and routines into my everyday life the way that I typically do. Now, the one thing that I've always tried to do on this channel is be open and honest with you guys, not pretend to be an expert when I'm not, not try to pretend like I have my shit together when I don't. And right now I feel like I'm just starting to get my shit together. Over the past couple days, I've been figuring out new ways to create healthy habits, routines, and structure. That's really the most important thing I've been trying to figure out because when you're at home all day, that leads to different hurdles, different challenges that you have to overcome. And so I wanted to share with you guys some of the things that I've been learning. So I've really started to cut back on the amount of media, especially the amount of news that I consume every day. For the past month or so, as we've been trying to figure out whether or not we need to postpone and cancel our wedding in Italy, which we inevitably ended up doing, which probably isn't too much of a surprise considering the circumstances, we were just glued in every single day, checking every 15, 20 minutes. And then even after we postponed our wedding, that did not change for me. I just, every morning I'd wake up, looking at my phone, checking it throughout the day. And what I found was that the more I checked, the more overwhelmed, frustrated, and miserable I felt. And while I do think it's important for us to be informed I think that there is only so much that we could do until we realize, okay, I know enough. I'm doing enough to help. I'm doing my part. There was a great podcast I listened to recently by Sam Harris where he talks about these precautions of washing your hands and social distancing and comparing them to wearing a seatbelt. Once you're motivated, once you understand the utility, none of us have to feel anxiety when we get behind the wheel of a car to motivate us to clip in our seatbelt. That gesture now is an automaticity. And I think the same can be true of a response to a crisis like this. I mean, once you figure out what you should do, well, then you can just do that thing. And all this ambient anxiety can be dialed down. And that's this week's Motivation Monday. Have a motivated Monday and a wonderful week. Please like and subscribe to CLA's YouTube channel. And thanks for watching.